Welcome to Real Addiction Talk with your host, James Gibbons. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Real Addiction Talk with your host, James Gibbons. I want to thank everybody for joining us today as we get closer and closer to that warmer weather, spring season. It's just right, right around the corner here. But I do want to thank you for joining us on, on our fourth episode of Real Addiction Talk. Now, before we do get started here, I, I do want to let you know that we have teamed up with uh, Scribd. Um, and we are allowing our, user, our uh, listeners two free months of Scribd. Um, what is Scribd? It's a vast digital library filled with ebooks, audiobooks, podcasts, magazines, news articles, sheet music, documents, and so much more. Uh, it's a great, wonderful uh, platform if you're a, a reader, a listener, if you're into music, um, all kinds of, of valuable information on that, on that app. Um, so if you go on our website at www.realaddictiontalk.com, or our Facebook page uh, at Real Addiction Talk, or Twitter page at Addiction underscore Talk. You can go ahead and find that link, click on it, and then uh, you'll get two free months of script. Today's episode is focused on relapse prevention and the five rules of recovery. And I got the majority of this uh, value, valuable information from um, the Yale Journal of Biology and Medicine. And this is actually written by uh, uh, Stephen Malemis. And I'm going to go ahead and highlight the, the important points in this article because I think it does a really good job of explaining, you know, what relapse prevention is and the five important rules on how we can live a clean and sober life moving forward. Um, but I do want to start with just the relapse prevention part real quick. And there are four main ideas in relapse prevention. First, relapse is a gradual process with distinct changes. Um, the goal in early recovery is to help individuals recognize the early stages in which uh, the chances of success are greatest. Uh, number two, recovery is a process of personal growth with, with developmental milestones. Each stage of recovery has its own risks of relapse. Number three, the main tools of relapse prevention are cognitive therapy and mind-body relaxation, which change negative thinking and develop healthy coping skills. And finally, number four, most relapses can be explained in terms of a few basic rules. So let's just go ahead and go over the stages of relapse and what they are. And, and the first one we're going to talk about is emotional relapse. So during emotional relapse, individuals are not thinking about using. They remember their last relapse and they don't want to repeat it. But their emotions and behaviors are setting them up for relapse down the road. Because clients are not consciously, or I'm sorry, people who are not, you know, people who are currently in recovery, I'm, I'm used to saying clients, um, but people who are in early recovery, they're not consciously thinking about using during this stage, denial is a big part of emotional relapse. And some common signs of emotional relapse include bottling up emotions, isolating, not going to your support meetings, uh, focusing on others and their problems, poor eating and sleeping habits. And one of the biggest goals is um, when we start identifying ourselves in this emotional relapse stage, is to understand what self-care means and why it's important. Um, we have to understand that you know, we have to take care of ourselves first. And we have to practice you know, mindfulness, self-care practices on a regular basis to help ease those emotional triggers. Uh, the second one is mental relapse. And in the mental relapse, there is a war going on inside people's minds. So part of them wants to use, but part of them doesn't. And as individuals go deeper into this mental relapse, 
uh, their cognitive resistance to relapse diminishes and their need for escape increases. And here are some of the common signs of mental relapse. Craving for drugs or alcohol. Thinking about people, places, and things associated with past use. Minimizing consequences of past use or glamorizing past use. Bar bargaining. Lying. Um, thinking of ways on how to better control using. And they're often looking for relapse opportunities and planning a relapse. So in this stage, we have to avoid high-risk situations at all costs. And in order to do that, the first thing we have to do is actually identify what they are. And then come up with a plan on how we can avoid them at all costs. And the third um, stage is called the physical relapse. And this is when an individual starts using again. Um, there are several, and a lot more are coming out and, and saying this as well, is that a lot of researchers divide physical relapse into a lapse and a relapse. And the difference is a lapse is we're working the program, we're trying to be clean and sober, we're motivated to stay sober, but for some odd reason, things pile up and we're not able to cope with our triggers very well. And what happens is we might use um, one day, but the next day we get back on track, we're honest about it, we go back to our support groups, uh, and we get back on track immediately. Relapse is going right back to our old behaviors, our old ways of using. And it's important to understand this because a lot of times when people have a lapse in recovery, they begin to feel a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of remorse. And it's very important to, to not go that route because that's going to end up um, derailing us in our recovery. So... You know, when we have a lapse, and hopefully we don't, but if we do, we have to stay positive, get back on track immediately, be honest about it, and, and, and start working the program again. That's very important. Because the last thing we want to do is go back into a full-blown relapse. And unfortunately, that could take off another 5, 10, 15, 20 years off of our lives. So we have to avoid that at all costs. So the next thing I, I want to go into is the five rules of recovery. And you know, I, I've known about these rules for quite a while now. I, I believe this article came out in 2015. But the more I look into these rules, the more I, I realize that every single one of these rules is necessary to follow in recovery. So I'm going to go through each one of these, and there's five of them. And, and hopefully, you know, as you're listening, kind of ask yourself, well, am I, am I following this rule? You know, what are some things that I'm missing from this rule that I can start utilizing today? Because at the end, I'm going to ask you some questions about each rule. And if you answer no to a lot of these questions, well, maybe that's a really, you know, you'll, you'll need to focus on moving forward. But the first rule of recovery is change your life. And the most important rule of recovery is that a person does not achieve recovery by just not using. That's just one aspect of it. There's a whole series of events that have to go into our recovery. You know, recovery involves creating a new life in which is easier to not use. And when individuals do not change their lives, then all the factors that contribute to their addiction will eventually catch up with them. You know, I usually say the quote, recovery is easy. You just have to change everything. Um, but a lot of times people who are in recovery, they often begin by hoping that they don't have to change. They often enter, you know, maybe treatment or, or some type of support group or, or some type of... Uh, a way to, to help them get started rec recovery, but they, they often say, we, you know, I want my whole life back without the using. And we have to understand that this wishing for your old life back is like wishing for relapse. So rather than seeing the need for change as a negative, you know, 
they are encouraged to see recovery as an opportunity for change. And if they make the necessary changes, they can go forward and be happier than they were before. And this is the silver lining of having an addiction. It forces people to reevaluate their lives and make changes that non-users don't have to make. And a lot of times, you know, I have to remind people who come and see me for their addiction that this could be a very exciting time in your life because now you're going to start creating goals. You're going to start making some lifestyle changes that you thought you would never make in your life. And you're going to start achieving those goals. You're going to start seeing progress in your life. Things are going to start happening that you thought would never, ever happen because of reuse. Um, so recovering individuals are often overwhelmed by the idea of change. As part of, you know, as part of our all or nothing thinking, we assume that change means that we must change everything in our lives. Um, and it helps us to know that there is usually, you know, only a small percent of our lives that needs to be changed. It can also be assuring to know that most people have the same problems and need to make some of their changes because we're not alone in this. So, so some examples of change um, can be divided up into three different categories. Number one, change negative thinking patterns. Number two, avoid people, places, and things associated with using. And number three, incorporate the five rules of recovery, which we are going over right now. We need to develop a healthy fear of the people, places, and things that we're part of using. But this requires significant mental restraint because those people, places, and things were previously associated with positive emotions. Also, we tend to think that developing a healthy fear of these things is showing weakness or accepting defeat, and it's not. Which leads us up to number two, rule number two. Be completely honest. Believe it or not, addiction requires lying. You know, <laughs> and I'm sure you're, you're probably thinking right now, what? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes we begin to even believe our own lies. It's a very strong defense mechanism to help you know, to help protect our use, our addiction. But we must lie about getting the, the drug, hiding the drug, denying the consequences, and planning the next relapse. And eventually, people who are using end up lying to themselves. And it shows that when client, you know, when people in recovery feel they cannot be completely honest, it is a sign of emotional relapse. It is often said that recovering individuals are as sick as their secrets. And one of the challenges in early recovery is to help individuals practice telling the truth and practice admitting when they have misspoken and quick, quickly corrected because it's going to be very hard to be honest early in recovery because they're so used to lying. So it's, it's, going to, it's a gradual process, but luckily everyone is able to you know, develop the skill. So how honest should a person be without jeopardizing you know, his or her work or relationships? So people in recovery are encouraged to understand the concept of recovery circle. And this is a group of people that includes family, just family members, doctors, counselors, self-help groups, and sponsors. And individuals are encouraged to be completely honest within the recovery circle. And as we become more comfortable, we may choose to expand the size of that circle. Um, <clears throat> Probably the most common misinterpretation of complete honesty is when individuals feel they must be honest about what is wrong with other people. And honesty, of course, is self-honesty. I like to tell a lot of people that a simple test of complete honesty is that they should feel uncomfortably honest when sharing within the recovery circle. And this is especially important in self-help groups in which, after a while, individuals sometimes start to go through the motions of participating. And a common question about honesty is how honest should a person be when dealing with past lies? And the general answer is that honesty is always preferable, except for it may harm others. Rule number three is ask for help. So most people start recovery by trying to do it on their own. You know, they want to prove that they have control over their addiction and they are not as unhealthy as people think. And joining a self-help group has been shown to significantly increase the chances of long-term recovery. You know, the combination of a substance abuse program and self-help group is the most effective. And there are many self-help groups out there to choose from. AA, NA, MA, CA, and you're probably wondering what they are. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Marijuana Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous. There's 
Last time I checked, I think there were over 160 different types of anonymous meetings out there in the world. Uh, and depending on where you live, if you live in a small town, you know, your options might be very uh, sc uh, uh, scarce. Uh, but if you live in a bigger city, you can probably find a meeting every day, every hour of the day. And there are some, these are some of the most recognized benefits of active participation in self-help groups. And they include Number one, individuals feel that they are not alone. Number two, they learn what the voice of addiction sounds like by hearing it in others. Number three, they learn how other people have done recovery and what coping skills have been successful. And number four, they have a safe place to go where they will not be judged. And there is one benefit of self-help groups that deserve special attention. So guilt and shame are common emotions in addiction. And these can be obstacles to recovery because individuals may feel that they have been damaged by their addiction and they don't deserve recovery or happiness. And clinical experience has shown that self-help groups help individuals overcome their guilt and shame of addiction by seeing that they are not alone. They feel that recovery is within their reach. And so here are some common um, reasons why clients or people in early recovery um, may not want to join a self-help group. And some of these uh, include, if I join a group, I would be admitting that I'm an addict or alcoholic. I want to do it on my own. I don't like groups. I'm not a joiner. I don't like speaking in front of other people. I don't want to switch from one addiction to become addicted to AA or NA. I'm afraid I'll be recognized, and I don't like religious aspects. And the negative thinking in all of these objections is material for cognitive therapy. You know, understanding that, you know, until you actually go to a meeting, you know, you're not going to know how it's going to benefit you in, in your recovery. So I highly encourage that if you've never attended a self-help group, well, try it. What do you have to lose? You know, if you have truly surrendered to your addiction, um, you have to be open yeah, and you have to be willing to try new things. So go ahead and try a meeting. It might be the best thing that's ever happened to you. Uh, rule number four is practice self-care. And to understand the importance of self-care, it helps to understand why most people use drugs and alcohol. So most people use to escape, relax, or reward themselves. And these are the primary benefits of using. It helps to acknowledge these benefits in, in, you know, in therapy, if, if, if you're going to therapy or you're thinking about going to therapy, so that individuals can understand the importance of self-care and be motivated to find healthy alternatives. So despite its importance, self-care is one of the most overlooked aspects of recovery because without it, individuals can go to self-help meetings, have a sponsor, do step work, and still relapse. Self-care is difficult because recovering individuals tend to be hard on themselves. This can present, you know, overly as individuals who don't feel that they deserve to be good to themselves, who tend to put themselves last, or it can show up convertly as individuals who say they can be good to themselves but who are actually ruthlessly critical of themselves. And self-care is especially difficult for adult children of addicts. And a missing piece of the puzzle for many people in recovery is understanding the difference between selfishness and self-care. So selfishness is taking more than a person needs. Self-care is taking as much as one needs. And clinical experience has shown that addicted individuals typically take less than they need. And as a result, they become exhausted or resentful and turn to their addiction to relax or escape. And part of challenging addictive thinking is to encourage people in recovery to see that they cannot be good to others if they are first not good to themselves. Um, and individuals use drugs and alcohol to escape negative emotions. However, they also use as a reward or to enhance positive emotions. Poor self-care also plays a role in these situations. Because in these situations, poor self-care often precedes drug or alcohol use. So, for example, individuals work hard to achieve a goal, and when it is achieved, they want to celebrate. But as part of their all-or-nothing thinking, while they were working, they felt they didn't deserve a reward until the job was done. Since they did not allow themselves small rewards during the work, the only reward that will suffice, suffice at the end is a big reward, which in the past has meant using. So don't forget to reward yourself for your small celebrations while in recovery. So if you have a month of, of, of sobriety, you know, don't be afraid to go out and get some ice cream or go to a movie or buy something online. 
Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a huge reward, just small rewards throughout your journey of recovery. And self-care involves mind, bo mind body relaxation. And numerous studies have shown that mind body relaxation reduces the use of drugs and alcohol and is effective in long-term relapse prevention. Relapse prevention therapy and mind body relaxation are commonly, commonly combined into mindfulness based relapse prevention. Um, and mind body relaxation plays a number of roles in recovery. So first off, stress and tension are common triggers of relapse. Second, mind-body relaxation helps individuals let go of negative thinking, such as dwelling on the past or worrying about the future, which are triggers for relapse. relapse. And third, mind-body relaxation is a way of being kind to oneself. The practice of self-care during mind-body relaxation translates into self-care in the rest of life. Part of creating a new life and recovery is finding time to relax. And finally, rule number five, don't bend the rules. The purpose of this rule is to remind individuals not to resist or sabotage change by insisting that they do recover either way. A simple test of whether a person is bending the rules is if they look for loopholes in recovery. A warning sign is when, when people in recovery ask for professional help and consistently ignore the advice. And this happens quite a bit um, with, with a lot of you know clients that I, that I help at the facility that I work at. You know... Um, you know, pr brainstorming suggestions on how to live a clean and sober life, creating an action plan, and um, which looks great on paper, but actions speak louder than words. And the only way how we're going to get over this horrible disease of addiction is to actually implement these steps into our recovery. Um, but once individuals in recovery have been in recovery for a while, they can be divided into two categories, non-users and denied users. Non-users say that using was fun, but acknowledge that it was not, you know, it hasn't been fun lately. And they want to start the next chapter of their life. Denied users will not or cannot fully acknowledge the extent of their addiction. They cannot imagine life without using. Uh, denied users invariably make a secret deal with themselves that at some point they will try using again. Important milestones such as recovery anniversaries are often seen as reasons to use. Alternatively, alternatively once a milestone is, is reached, individuals feel they have recovered enough that they can determine when and how to use safely. And it's remarkable on how many people have relapsed this way, 5, 10, or 15 years after recovery. So individuals are encouraged to identify whether they are non-users or denied users. A denied user is a chronic is in chronic mental relapse and at high risk for future relapse. And clinical experience has shown that er everyone in early recovery is a denied user. And the goal is to help individuals move from denied users to non-users. And that's the five rules of recovery in a nutshell. Um, you know, just to summarize, individuals, you know, they don't achieve recovery by just not using again. And that's important to repeat because that's just one of many aspects of, of recovery is not using. Recovery involves creating a new life in which it is easier to not use. And if individuals do not change their lives, then all the factors that contributed to their addiction will start, you know, will still be there. Just waiting for the perfect opportunity to uh, come out and, and use. Uh, but most individuals begin recovery by hoping to get back their old life without the using. Um, relapse is a gradual process that begins weeks and sometimes months before an individual picks up a drug or a drink. And, and just keep in mind that there are three stages to relapse. Emotional, mental, and the physical. Um, so there you have it. Relapse prevention and the five rules of recovery. And I hope that helps you um, if you're currently dealing with an active addiction or you're currently in early recovery or maybe you've had several years of, of sobriety. You know, it's, it's a lifelong battle. And each day, we, each night when we go to bed at night, sober is a battle won because we're trying to win the war. And if you are currently suffering with an active addiction, just remember that you're not alone. Um, 
there are many resources out there that you can utilize if needed. Um, you know, like, especially myself, feel free to visit our, our website at www.realaddictiontalk.com or you know, visiting our Facebook page or, or Twitter. Um, and we'll be more than happy to help you if needed. That's what we're here for because the goal is to get better and we can't do it on our own. Um, I want to thank you for, for joining us today for our fourth episode of Real Addiction Talk. I hope uh, to see you again in the near future. And don't forget to uh, visit our website and, and sign up for our newsletter and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. We're on several of them. Thank you again. This is Real Addiction Talk. Your host, James Gibbons, signing out. This is how it ends.